Okay, now last time we went through a little exercise where we figured out about what it's going to cost to heat your greenhouse. Now in some cases, you know, uh, that's kind of cost prohibitive because heat costs a lot of money. You know, gas bill, light bill, whatever you got here, do it. It could get quite expensive. And so what we wanted to do was uh, see if we can get a little more creative than that. Now, there is another way you can do this, and I'll just talk about this for a second. I mean, if you want to get a little wood stove or something, you can do that. But again, that's fuel. you got to buy the wood. Or if you live in a place or you're somewhere where you can get wood for nothing, uh, yeah, I guess you could do that, and it would work quite well. But what I don't like about that, even if the wood was free, is that it makes you have to tend the stove. You have to get up at night and go out there and put some more wood on the fire and things like that. Now, if you don't mind doing that, <clears throat> that's probably a pretty good solution. But if you do mind doing that, or you don't have a free source of wood, the other thing that you can do is uh, do something called passive heating. Now, passive heating, all that means is that uh, you're not going to put any heat into the greenhouse from an external source, such as uh, an electric heater or a gas heater, a propane heater, something like that. You're, just, you're not going to do that. You're going to try to take advantage of excess heat that you have in the greenhouse during the daytime, store that somehow, and then at night put that heat back into the greenhouse to warm it up a little bit to keep it from freezing. Now, if you're going to do that, the first thing you've got to figure out is do you have any excess heat to work with? So uh, let's go through a little exercise and figure that out right now. Now here's a couple of examples of some greenhouse temperatures that I've laid out on a couple of different graphs. Now supposing your greenhouse temperatures are like it is on the left. During the day with uh, no intervention, no heating, no nothing, it's just a good sealed up greenhouse. You see in the winter time, on the worst days, 90 degrees in there for a high and then a low at night of 20 degrees. Well the best you're going to ever get to with passive heating is the average of that, and that's going to be 55 degrees. Now if you look at the, uh, the graph on the right side, supposing this is what you see in the winter time on the worst days, 45 degrees for a high and 20 degrees for a low. Now the best you're going to do there with uh, passive heating again is 32 degrees. Okay, now I've added to these little graphs what you might see if you install passive heating in both of these environments. Now, of course, you know what passive heating is going to do is during the day, it'll reduce your high temperature because it's storing that heat away. And at night, it'll raise your low temperature because it's releasing the heat at night. So this is what you could see. This is what could be a, perhaps a realistic uh, expectation. So again, <clears throat> you look at the, uh, the graph on the left side, instead of 90 and 20 for two extremes, you might see 75 and 40 for the two extremes. Now that brings this greenhouse up above freezing quite nicely. So if that's what you're really trying to do, this is a good candidate for passive heating. Now again, you look at the one on the left, I mean, I'm sorry, look at the one on the right, now, again, it does the same thing as the one on the left does. It'll bring the high down a little bit and the low up a little bit. But you see, what's still happening is that at night with this one, even though the lows come up a little bit, uh, it's still well below freezing. So this really isn't going to do this, do this greenhouse any good. So this is probably not a good candidate for just passive heating. But there are other things we can do with it, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay, so if you're the guy on the left side of our chart and you want to take advantage of passive heating, it looks like you do have some excess heat that you can take advantage of, well, you've got to find something to store the heat in. That's the first step. Now, there's only really two possible things that you can use that are rational to get. You see, there are, there are some crazy things that you can get that are high-tech, leading-edge type things, but we're not going to talk about those because they're expensive and just not realistic. We want to get something that the average greenhouse gardener can get a hold of quite easily. And there's only two possibilities. There's water, 
because water has a very high specific heat content capacity, and there's dirt, earth. And uh, dirt doesn't have a very high specific heat content capacity, but there's a lot of it around, and if you use enough of it, you can make an earth battery. And we'll talk about an earth battery a little bit later, because an earth battery has another special property that can make the guy on the right side of our chart maybe not lose hope. But we'll talk about that a little bit later on. But for right now, if, if you're the guy on the left side of the chart, you want to use something passive, we're going to talk about water. Now, for water... One of the simplest things you can do is get yourself something to hold the water in that you can put in the sunshine. Now the easiest thing to do is probably some barrels like this guy's got here. Now what you can do is line those barrels up on north wall of your greenhouse if you're in the northern hemisphere. That way in the winter time the sun will shine on them and, and warm them up and also it will absorb heat from the greenhouse inside. Now it's best to have them painted black or naturally black because that will absorb and discharge heat the best. Now if you have a greenhouse that's about the size of my greenhouse, which again is about a thousand square feet, you're probably going to need about 2,000 gallons of water in those barrels. And since the barrels are 55 gallons each approximately, that means you're going to need 38 or 40 barrels, something like that, to get to the 2,000 gallon mark. Now, that also means, because they're about two and a half feet in diameter, now, you know, they give me a little, uh, take that with a grain of salt, they're about two and a half feet in diameter, so that means that if you double stack them, it's going to take 50 feet of linear wall space to stack them up. Now, maybe if you triple stack them, it would be a little smaller than that. But that's kind of the size uh, of what you're going to be looking at. And maybe for some people, that's taking up too much space. But it will get you to something like the guy on the left of this chart. If you have these similar situations to what he's got, 90 degrees in the day and 20 degrees at night, well, something like you know, 2,000 gallons of water in these barrels stacked along a north wall will get you something like this. Okay, so that's about the simplest thing you can do. Stack up a bunch of barrels of water on the north wall of your greenhouse, if you're in the northern hemisphere, and just let the sun shine on it and, and, and the air in the greenhouse heat it up during the day and give off the heat at night. And it will work, as long as you have the initial condition to the left side of that chart. Because if you don't have any excess heat to store, you know, it's not going to make heat for you. It's just not going to do that. But it can get you to where you can get your uh, heat uh, above freezing at night, if, if you've got the same situation that that chart shows. Now, you can do something a little more complicated than that, which is what I've chosen to do. And it is much more effective, but it's a little more complicated, not too much. Now, if, if you like this video, let me know, and the next video I'll put out to show you what you can do that's a little more complicated, but quite a bit more effective. Now, there's one more thing that we need to talk about, and that's, if you're going to do this with uh, barrels of water, it's much better to use metal barrels than plastic barrels, because plastic does have some thermal resistance as far as transferring heat energy in and out of that barrel. And when you look at the numbers, basically the water barrels that are made out of steel are a hundred times better at transferring heat across that barrel wall than a plastic barrel is. The bottom line of that is that from a thermodynamics point of view, uh, if you're looking at transferring heat in and out of the water, as far as the heat transfer goes, the uh, the wall, the metal barrel wall, isn't even there. The heat transfers directly into the water, and uh, you're basically limited by how fast the water can absorb the heat. Whereas if you have a plastic barrel, the plastic wall does play a role in how fast the heat can transfer into the water. So there your limiting factor would be the plastic itself. And in the, in the a metal barrel, your limiting factor would be the water itself. So it is a much better and more efficient way to transfer heat in and out of the water 
is a metal barrier and a plastic barrier.